Hello and welcome to our latest RegCast. My name's Tim Phillips. Now, as you know, at the Reg, we prefer real worlds to the, uh, the fantasy world that some vendors like to talk about. And uh, often this has been a case, you've told us, with the way in which some vendors talk about cloud technologies in particular. So uh, we're pleased to be talking to Star today because uh, they're guys that like to deal with the cloud practically and deal with business problems practically, uh, rather than uh, some abstract concepts that uh, they're going to help you solve, but they're not necessarily going to help you solve your business problems. So uh, with us today from um, Star is Grant Tanner. Grant, welcome. Uh, hi, Tim. How are you doing? Not too bad. I hope you're doing well yourself. Um, Grant, tell me a little bit about Star, because uh, some people won't know who you are, and some people will assume that you are uh, just like every other cloud company. Hi, so my name is Grant Tanner, Business Development Director, sit on the operational board of Star. Star is a business that's been going in the UK for 16 years. Um, its target market is around the mid-market up to some of the larger organizations in the UK. Effectively, uh, we have leveraged um, cloud solutions to provide some uh, solutions around some key verticals. Um, our really taking almost STAR as a case study in the trials and tribulations we've gone through to enter that market. Um, and you could probably say that we've been in this market for about three and a bit years. Um, our strategy is really to create solutions end-to-end. Um, we're still quite a smallish organization. We operate around 50 million pound turnover, but we have a large ecosystem that allows us to pull on that specialist skill set for some key verticals of which we're going to talk to a little bit today. What I would view STAR as, though, for those that are listening, is almost we are a case study of, of how to develop cloud services yourself. So that's what I would probably tend to look at as STAR, as actually how, how has STAR done this, and this is something that either we could do as an organization, or um, we could probably leave with some of, cloud, uh, some of our learning. So hopefully, Tim, you're, you're asking me a few challenging questions, and I might have some answers for you. Well, I really hope you will. And uh, I mean, this is uh, this is very important because uh, uh, a lot of uh, vendors talk about cloud as if uh, it's just a single a single solution to a single problem. The cloud is just like a big bag of computers, and uh, you can rent some of that. But I know in our first segment today we're talking about retail and the uh, and the problems of uh, for retailers of adapting to new technology. This is not really the way that retailers think about IT, is it? And uh, this is certainly not how they think about their business problems. You've provided us with this slide, Grant, showing um, the, how changing consumer habits have uh, made it a lot more complicated for retailers to deal with their business problems at the moment. Uh, absolutely. And I guess one sort of uh, caveat I've put around, around STAR is that in order for us to deliver these services, we do have to run some very complex solutions at our back office. So we do have data centers, UK networking, storage, etc. cetera. Um, we're very close to our retail customers, managing a couple of the larger ones. Um, and all, all the thing about retailers today is how they're moving closer to the customer or the cu customer is moving closer to them. And um, I guess a great example of that is the rise of things like social media, smartphones, and devices that make the ease of retailing so much easier. Um, so this has gone a little bit uh, in, into the sort of new world now. This isn't so much just web and walk. It's web and web. You know, you're, you're not going into walking into the stores. Um, did you like that, Tim, the web and web? <laughs> I said there was a little, too, yeah, there was a little chuckle. It's, it's sort of web and walk and sit down and watch and do and phone and everything I, in, and, and a lot of things like this. Now, traditionally, uh, retail technology has been founded on you know, several very large monolithic systems that tend to stay in place for quite a long time, don't they? So I guess this as well, Graham, makes it uncomfortable to suddenly have all these new channels to the, uh, to the customer. Uh, absolutely, and I think the retailers that we work with are trying to develop their own platform as a service for, you know, within their own estates. And uh, you know, Star sometimes provides that end-to-end. -end. Sometimes we're just providing the infrastructure of the service, perhaps based on a, a virtual compute infrastructure, to fulfill one of the categories on that on that slide deck. Um, so you know, we are seeing a massive rise in obviously the use of uh, devices in smartphones and and how those uh, apps are being deployed. So we we find ourselves being pulled into 
uh, different areas away from our core business of infrastructure to start working with um, you know mobile operators, app developers, social media type companies as really the role of, of retailers are changing. Um, we don't operate so much in the FMCG space of retail. Um, and, and again, we're seeing that change now to more of that sort of, I don't know, coffee culture type, um, you know, retailing where, you, where you're going to go in and sit in Starbucks for the afternoon, order your shopping on your, on your uh, iPad, and then someone's going to walk around with a bag in, in front of you so you don't have to leave your seat. Um, we're not, not, quite, not quite there yet, but in terms of actually helping other retailers manage big data, so I think that's one thing that comes across. You know, these are monolithic systems managing millions of SKUs, um, it, it, which, which require big data infrastructures, i.e., you know, uh, SAP, SQL, Oracle, all the usual suspects. So how do you get that into a distributed fashion that centralizes applications that then distributes them out to your customer, your store, to your, to your warehouse housing manager, and all of the supply chain. And I think over the years, many people talk about the, um, uh, you know, the, the drawing together of these systems and sort of uh, you know, a centralization. I think with cloud, you're now seeing the reverse of that, where it's a centralization, but a distribution. And so long as the centralization is secure, um, i.e., it's a private cloud infrastructure, it can actually bring a lot of innovation to you as a retailer. And, Speaking to CIOs that I do, innovation is the, is the, you know, through IT is the growth area for them um, because they really haven't done it in the past. Well, let's look, I'm looking at, let's look at this slide now, Grant. You can see the two out of the three points here being not innovating and being slow to react. This is very often the accusation for retailers. But um, I know when we talk to them, they come back to us and say it's more important that if, if it isn't broken, don't try and fix it because they have to do business every day. Now they have to do business 24 hours a day. So yeah. what we're talking about here now is evolving, but not this isn't a, a rip your systems out thing that we're talking about with cloud. Is it? This, this is going to be a pretty slow and secure evolution of what they're doing. Absolutely. So, so we've created um, a, a model called um, Retail Hub, which we've, which we've taken to market. And, and the message there is that actually you've got some line of business applications that ultimately run your business. Now, typically in, in retail, that would be warehousing, distribution, and billing, the whole supply chain piece. So what we would advocate is that you federate into those solutions. As a really good example, if, if you take um, – I know Thomas Pink quite well, having people that work, know people that work there. Well, they have a pretty resilient data center in one of their warehouses, which runs their warehousing and distribution um, architecture. So there would be no point for them physically moving that into a cloud service. However, federating that through to um, stores online and ultimately tablet or, or, or smartphone is something they would consider doing. So they can leverage some of the cloud services to, to make that holistic approach to deliver the service back to their customers. Um, so, you know, it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. I know these things come up a lot within cloud. You know, the legacy systems are really important because they're legacy for a reason. They've been around a long time. They're running your system. They're, they're running your, your, your businesses, so handle with care. Um, I, I think that, you know, there's been quite a lot of retailers burnt through high-end system integration that have taken way too long to move off of legacy systems to do something innovative and really haven't got the return of investment for doing that. Mm. Now, I, I, but also we know that um, retail is a seasonal business. Um, volumes go up and volumes go down, especially when we're talking about internet uh, volumes. Absolutely. Again, is, this something, is this something that cloud, I mean, it is obviously something that cloud can help with in a general sense, but retailers have special problems bursting to the cloud on this, surely, with um, highly vertical systems. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's a brilliant point, actually, Tim. And I think you know we, we've got some solutions around that. And you know at the seasonality thing, and when people go into lockdown as well around that, so they want to scale the systems but aren't allowed to in case the thing crashes. So I think you have to look at things like content distribution uh, as as an example of, sort of uh, providing that from a cloud type infrastructure. So most of the large retailers adopt some form of, of content distribution. Um, you know, to, to hold things like catalog or rich content or adverts or whatever. 
you know, because they want the, the pull through um, in terms of, of people web browsing, you know, the, the speed and the experience to be quicker. So you know, you'll find people like Star are encompassing some of those type solutions. I mean, you know, we use level three for that. Um, so actually say, look, you know, you can do your web infrastructure within the cloud in a data center residing in Star, but actually your rich content and to, to man manage the peaks and troughs of people hitting your website can effectively be cached in the cloud by a smart piece of CDN technology. Um, and I know that you know, there are applications out there that do that as well, like Adobe you know, use an awful lot of those services. But that, that's, a, that's a real life example that if you are building, five years ago you would have just built lots and lots of compute infrastructure around your web farm. You know, cloud now says, actually, I don't have to spend a load of money on compute. You know, I mean physical hardware in data centers. I actually just need somewhere for this content to live so where could it live? And things like a CDN network, certainly for Star, give us that flexibility. And it really becomes pay as you, pay as you go, which ultimately you know, means you're a cloud provider as opposed to a hosting provider. Yes. Now, also another aspect of retail is that business goes on in a lot of locations, a lot of quite small locations sometimes, and um, locations where there isn't any readily available IT support. Does cloud help with that at all? Um, oh, that's an interesting thing. So I think if you're talking about um, if you're a high street retailer, and I must be honest, you know, with with someone like Star, we're, we're probably more more known for our high street retailing brands than our e-commerce web, web uh, you know, our e-commerce brands. Um, so you know, again, it's not quite a cloud service, but actually centralizing some of that, where your large data, your web farms, your EPOS systems are actually in a central location where you can access it through cloud obviously gives you some, uh, um, you know, it, it just reduces the cost of the maintenance fees and, and the support elements. Um, but if you're a, an ASOS, and again, we speak to them quite a bit, you know, you're in a very different, different marketplace where actually everything for you is cloud, and you can spend most of your money on how you grow your business. Mm. And a lot of people think that um, naturally sort of, you know, retail is a global business. Actually, a lot of retail is really extremely local, isn't it? Absolutely, and I think it's that that thing of um, if, if you take a store, you know, a store today is, you know, some stores are, are I've got to be careful here, not not to tread on the on the on the PC route or the non PC route, but you know, you, you want. Okay, come on, you say it. You say what's on your mind. What I'm saying is that you know, if you've got you know young people going to work in retail that are used to using smartphones and their their Apple Macs and Facebook and everything else putting them in front of a green screen in your high street is not going to get the best performance out of them. Putting them in front of a, uh, an iPad where they can you know, drag and drop your order efficiently is something that would give them productivity and make use of the technology. And that's what we mean by innovation. Um, I don't know if anyone's walked in a, a high street recently and walked into a Barclays where they've actually refit, refitted out all of the Barclays um, banks now that no longer have that counter staff. They actually have you know, the settees around and, and someone will come up to you with, a, with a, an iPad or similar brands are available, Tim, um, and, and go through, go through your, your ISAs and go through the mortgage options with you online you know, on a touch screen device. And you know, that, that's vastly different from where they were a year ago. And of course, the delivery of most of that infrastructure, Wi-Fi, maybe some networking, is generally centralized. And, and I think that way you know, your um, employees you know, get, get a little bit closer to the customer. Certainly, it's easier to train people because they already are using these devices. If you're fresh out of university, that's what you're used to doing. And of course, the productivity increases as, as a result. And um, I, I think Barclays have made a leap of faith in changing their physical buildings to do that. And it's very much following the sort of Apple iStore approach. And of course, customer service is, is enormous in in that. And, and you know, getting very good ratings of of customer service, which if you are a big retailer, that's incredibly important because that would build uh, brand loyalty. Mm, how difficult is it for you to convince your retail customers that you know their business? Because I imagine that some people who are listening to this at the moment who are in the retail business, they get pitched a lot by vendors. And in the, uh, in the second conversation, it turns out the vendors have absolutely not the slightest conception of what their working day is like. They just think retail is like any other business. So you must have that problem of establishing your own credibility. 
I, I, yes, yes, we do, and I wouldn't shy, shy away from saying we don't, but one thing we have done, and we're quite fortunate having been around so long, is just build on the provenance of the customers we had anyway. So, uh, you know, going back to that opening statement of, well, what did, what did cloud mean for staff? It meant that we've had to reinvent ourselves to use some of those cloud technologies, which we now sell. We've now got the benefit of actually looking at some key verticals and building up specialists in those areas. So when I talk about content distribution networking, we have system uh, architectures that, sorry, system architects that really understand that and work really closely with the, you know, the, the retailers and the suppliers. And I think professional um, consultative salespeople or account management or service people really have to get under the skin of what, what these verticals are demanding of us. So as they move closer to their customer, the supplier must move, move closer to, to them as, as their customer. So I think the whole thing evolves, evolves jointly. And, and I think you know, if you look at some of the really big successful brands that are out there, and I will cite ASOS as one, um, the thing that ASOS has done is created a culture to, to move this forward. And now that's something that you know, is a big, big topic. But culturally, someone like Star is very in tune with its retailers, as it is in tune with some of its other, retail, uh, its other verticals. And it's because we do do customer advisory board sessions. We bring people in. We do lots of events. And, that, and those are really, uh, you know, we look at the business process down as opposed to the infrastructure up. And that's been a massive change that Star's had to go through over the last three to four years. Mm. So um, uh, it sounds like this is not really a business for the um, for a, a hands-off uh, generic cloud company because they're not really selling the things that retail customers need. So it's a, it's a different cloud model to the one that we're often being sold. I think so, but we, you know we're, we're keeping it real because you know we know we can't do all of the end-to-end -end without you know some key partners. So so we work with which you know we formed a thing called the UK Cloud Alliance. Um, which, of which Star is the founder, and cheekily I head up, uh, Tim, so there's a little bit of a, a flag wave there. And the this, is, this is actually for you, publicity for yourself, not just for Star. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but, but that allows us to look for that degree of specialism around uh, about 16 categories, which they are technology-based categories. You know, we're not talking about producing HR and payroll outsourcing. You know, we're still talking about um, you know, a, a business process fueled by IT services. But it does allow us to work with um, organizations like uh, Moobaloo in the, in the app space to develop apps around our retailers, to work with um, people like Pythagoras in the, in the CRM space, which if you bolt these solutions together and we as, as a collective deliver them as a cloud service, pay as you go, that's got to be, you know, that really does bring innovation because the likelihood is that the larger telcos in the UK cannot do that, that they're too big to, and cumbersome to change. Um, whereas I think Star and its partner eco structure, you know, ecosystem just can deliver some of these things. Um, now, that really, again, it puts a little bit of power back into, into IT as well because then IT can actually become the true system integrator. So back to what a retailer would want, you know, retail has a place at the board in many of these organizations because the board are viewing IT as the only innovative solution to some of the challenges they have to get closer to customers. Okay, now Grant, to, to, to wrap it up, just before you, you plug yourself any more, because we've had enough of that now. I know, but, but, but to wrap it up, if there's, um, if there's anyone um, in, in the retail business who's dismissed cloud uh, before, said, this is not for us, this is not how we run our business, what's the one thing that you could say to them that might make them reassess that? So, so the key thing, and, and this is me uh, paraphrasing from CIOs, it's, it's innovation through IT. And, and, and what I mean by that is you've got to start viewing that your customer is going to transact, transact with you very, very differently. And to transact differently, you need to have a, a, an innovative spirit within your business. Um, so yes, you will still have to manage big data. Yes, you will still have to manage peaks and troughs in, in your retail spikes, run up to Christmas, run up to Valentine's Day in your case, Tim. Um, Etc. Um, but the uh, you know so, so so I think the key thing, and, and I'm delighted that CIOs are using the word innovation. You know, if if you look at that slide deck that says you know multiple access points now with to a customer base through IT, how are you going to do it? Because you know gone are the days of green screen EPOS systems. 
um, that, that will fulfill the Y generation's desire to spend money with you. you know, if you can't show that and make that a comfortable experience for somebody, they will walk to the shop next door. Okay, good. So Grant Hanna, thank you very much. That's, a, that's retail in the cloud, and that was Grant Hanna, not only an important man within Star, but an important man within the cloud in general. Grant and uh, thank you for that, and um, I know that you've got some insights into uh, a couple more uh, vertical markets that we'll be dealing with in uh, a separate Regcast segment. Thank you. Hello, welcome back to uh, Regcast Central. My name is Tim Phillips, and uh, we are talking about the cloud, but we're talking about the cloud in vertical markets because uh, we are, frankly, we, we're getting a little bit bored of all cloud vendors saying the same thing because we know that you're getting bored with it as well because it doesn't answer your business problems. So uh, to help me work through several uh, particular vertical market business problems, we've got um, Grant Tanner from Star. Grant, welcome back. Thank you very much, Tim. How are you today? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm well. I'm looking forward to what we're going to be talking about in this one because we're going to be talking about um, media. And uh, I mean, obviously, as, as part of the media myself, then uh, I know you're enthusiastic about this, Grant, because uh, I took the liberty of listening to your voicemails. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, and so the, uh, now, but um, we talk a lot about the in cloud as something that solves the problems of the continuing the, the inflation and the amount of resources that the IT department needs. Um, now, uh, from what you've been saying to us uh, earlier, this is never more appropriate than in, um, in media, is it? Uh, absolutely. Um, so I, I think that you know, media and, and, and people like you know, service providers like, like Star uh, have looked at media and say, wow, you know, people are going to spend loads of money with service providers because they all need big data and they all need stories and they all need delivery and they all need broadcast, etc., etc., etc. You know, the rise of adi adaptive bit rate and smart TVs mean you know, service providers out there are just going to be bundling cash in their pockets. Um, the reality is, it, I think it's been a bit of a damn squib. You know, I don't think anybody's really uh, you know, come up with any great solutions for digital media, other than the, uh, well, media in general, actually, but digital media is one where, where we're quite strong. Um, because, you know, quite frankly, it, it's such a specialized area, it's best trying to support your IT people in there um, with some of the solutions that, that, that are, if you like, common to them. So, so our take on on the media proposition is yes, we will help you create platforms for service around cloud. But ultimately, there's a really good, you know use us for the things that we do really well, and then re-engage with us for the things you do really well. Now, when you talk to uh, media companies, well, I suppose we ought to define our terms as well. On, on what do you consider to be media companies? Where does it stretch from and to? And I guess that's part of the problem of providing services for them, isn't it? Absolutely. So, I mean, you've got everything from global broadcast organizations through to creatives and advertising. Um, I mean, we are very firmly UK focused into media hubs, uh, which are really sort of geographic for us. So, looking at the media type companies that are using digital media in the main in Bristol, Manchester, and London. Um, so, we do do a little bit of work with some of the uh, agencies, whether they be sort of web design agencies or creative agencies, stroke advertisers. Um, we also do a little bit around um, some of the technology companies that are supporting you know, broadcasters. So, it, it's quite a mixed bag for us, um, but we don't do sort of global broadcasting connectivity and things like that or satellites. You know, we are looking at sort of more of the um, common applications. Um, but then we'd work with some key partners for things like, again, you know, rich content distribution if they, if they required it. But it is a very bit mixed bag, um, and I think that's half the challenge of, of trying to service this market. So you know, our view is, Star does this very, very well. Um, we can tailor this around, you, around your business, use and consume it, and then that will free you up to work on more of the innovation around your own digital, um, sorry, around your own media proposition. Well, let's have a look at the, what this is, the, the, the sorts of IT constraints that these companies are under, because I guess um, a lot of them want to be high-growth companies. They're quite tech-savvy companies, but they have very high IT demands, don't they? 
A absolutely. So, so I think that you know what, what we are saying is that there's a very simplistic uh, you know total cost of ownership model around what cloud could deliver to you, and these are things like common applications. And what I mean by that is things like email, voice, voice over IP, telephony. Um, and sort of down, you know, down into web hosting, back office hosting. These, these are things really that a cloud provider could, could deliver to you per, per person, per month, per seat. Pretty, pretty generic though, Grant. You know, anyone could have that. You don't have to be a media company to benefit for cloud for that. I, and, and I would agree. And, and you know, ultimately, you know, as a service provider, we, we are quite horizontal in terms of what, what we're offering. But the reality is, is that we do have some skill sets in account management that specialize in those three geographic regions where the, where the media companies truly are. So you've got people like Ardman down in Bristol. You've got uh, the BBC relocating into Manchester. And then you've got people like Saatchi and Saatchi and all of the large ad agencies in London. So we specifically have gone to, um, you know, you know, sales people, account management people, and service people that live and breathe this stuff, and will understand things like you know, uh, Flash, HTML, H.264, that those sort of uh, technologies are out there. So we are saying yes, we have a, a horizontal proposition that will support your business by reducing costs and delivering back those services better. But we also understand what it means to be a broadcaster in the in this market. Um, now that's quite different, I think, to to other um, service providers that are only providing the generic services. Mm. Now, what's, what other services then do you provide? Because I mean, these guys, they're working with uh, they're working with a lot of data, and you know, and they have to move that data around. I guess they, yeah. um, you know, and that sort of thing. Now, is, is that something that the cloud lends itself to? Absolutely, and I guess this is again quite a generic statement, but things like storage, archiving, backup, uh, BCP and disaster recovery are very, very quick wins when you talk to cloud providers. But again, it's very generic. So our view would be actually, you know, what rich content do you want to move around, and actually, you know, how much of the cloud could you leave before that? So again, um, looking at some of the largest DDN companies out there looking at some of our partners in terms of how they provide global transit. You know, the, the more that, that you can utilize cloud for, um, the, the, obviously the less pressure there is on your, your internal IT. You know, if you know using a cloud provider means your data is going to be load balanced across two data centers and it will just be available, then you, that lends itself very well to your workflow if you're a print and publisher. So you know, these, it's the thing, it's the thing about not just looking at large storage devices, but how does that help your business process? Um, and I think there's some great wins there that, that cloud that, that cloud give an organisation. Mm, talking to some cloud providers when they're, when they're talking about these, these problems of big storage data and everything like that, you get the idea of them just selling some sort of giant USB stick to. Uh, but you're saying that there are more things that you have to wrap around that if it's going to be useful for this. Sort of this type of customer. Uh, absolutely, and, and actually, these things you know do not have to be overly specialised. These things are things like SharePoint delivery, um, you know, content management systems, uh, you know, CRM systems, and I, and I think that the job that's, that Star's done quite well is pre-integrating those. So you know, we will deliver to a to a, a desk, uh, you know, a, a per person per desk, a pre-integrated solution for their unified comms. Um, that they're including all of their voice and applications, and and supporting some of their workflows. So it's actually, cloud is, is is a very quick way to move um, without too much risk into changing your workflow, and and that that would lend itself, say, to um, you know a print and publisher that that's using multiple inputs. I mean, you know, typically, Tim, someone like yourself that you know that may be writing an article out on your iPad. Well, you know, how do you get that to um, the reg in time for, for, for the delivery of, of their web content. You know, if you can provide some simple collaborative tools, which a lot of this is based on Microsoft Suite, okay, it makes it so much easier it, 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 because you use that every day anyway. So you don't have to jump off and use a different system for that. You can actually use the system you're used to using.
Mm, my boss at the Reg would be particularly interested in how do I get it to him on time. But uh, <laughs> yeah, this, this, uh, the, the, now, but I mean that gets back to the uh, the idea of media companies being there's no business in the world at the moment that isn't pressurised for time because if you can do something quicker, it's better. Generally speaking, media yeah. has to work to specific deadlines and it has to be able to do it quicker. You have to provide some sort of service level assurance for them in this case that uh, you know things will be available and um, that you will be able to achieve the sorts of, uh, the, you know, the sorts of service in handling their data that you promise how do you how do you cross that bridge well yeah so uh, let me I will answer that question but let, so another thing that that adds to that is really the uh, acquisitive nature of, of media companies right now you know with, with, with the lack of um, funds coming from you know advertising rates, etc. A lot of the production houses getting bought by well, you know, basically very large American production houses. It's then okay. This this data now is you know is copyrighted, important, and needs to be secure. But let, but let's say you know you and I are producing a film and we've just gone bust and Endemol have, have, have bought bought the rights to that. Then how do they get to that data if it's sitting in you know a, a storeroom that's locked away? So cloud services, just on that sort of, you know, that hosted storage element of, of that piece of data, really make it incredibly flexible for a business to say, well, actually, we have acquired, um, you know, Tim and Grant's business. Their data isn't sitting in underneath Tim's desk. It's actually sitting in a cloud provider. So we can now speak to that cloud provider and download that content. You know, that, that's what I mean by the sort of um, the use of use of cloud services. And I, I think. Again, that's understanding the sort of nature of, of media where it is today. Um, you know, it's not all about this thing of actually we're going to buy large pipes and distribute, you know, broadcast quality data. It's actually a little bit more simplistic in our world. It's how do we make sure data, and it's very large data, is secure, is replicated, is backed up, and delivered to where it needs to go. And even as far as putting an escrow service underneath that as well, so actually we, could, we can protect it. So um, you know, I, I think those things are, are things that IT want to hear um, because that is really you know business critical if those IT services aren't there anymore. And I can cite many uh, examples, uh, you know, Thames Television being one of them that are owned by uh, Pinewood Group. You know, they're going through a torrid time of closing down that site. Well, someone surely must be asking an IT, bloody hell, what do we do with this data? And if the data is sitting in one of their storerooms. There's probably a better route to do it, and, you know. And the better route is we should really have this stuff in the cloud, which is available to the new the new acquirer of our business. You know. <clears throat> now, a lot of data is is consumed very close. A lot of broadcast data is consumed very close to where it is produced, which is uh, something that uh, you know something that I I learned. And again, this goes back to the uh, sorts of relationships you have with. CDNs, uh, these sort of can optimize the delivery of information from one place to another. Absolutely. So, so you know, so we are, uh, you know, really understanding now that you know, got got the, the encoding, rendering um, uh, devices out out there that you know, need to be fit for purpose, and we need to understand that language, which we do. You know, so things like the role of H.264 in, in, in broadcast, you know, things that, are, you know, people buying smart TVs, how is the data going to be manipulated so everybody can get to it? You know, that stuff that's evolving within STAR that brings us much, much closer to understanding the vertical market that we play in, in media. And obviously, I'm talking about broadcast media there. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think we've got a bit of a blend of, of, of solutions because um, media is such a big, big vertical uh, in terms of, you know, all the different players. Um, but you know, but working with some smart people out there that live and breathe this stuff I mean, it means it it becomes very economic for the smaller companies to consume our services. You know what the enterprise is, is doing um, last year, the mid market does the year after, and Star is sort of almost the glue glue for that. You know, we can take enterprise class solutions, be that managing big storage demands, big databases, or the delivery of broadcast type. Um, uh, you know, quality of media down into the mid market, and and let's face it, the mid market in media are small production teams, are are small um, creatives, are people that are managing content, and a massive technology piece. And you know, Star is a technology company at heart. So when we, we love these conversations with media that get into get into that uh, complex technology piece because we've got some very good solutions around it, um, which 
I think, allow maybe some of the larger companies to be a little bit more flexible about their merger and acquisition uh, targets. Right, it's, it's almost a challenge for some of the people who are listening now. Give Star a call and see if you can confuse them with your jargon. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but it, it's uh, for, for some of those guys as well. Isn't there an incentive for them to um, to work with just the largest possible cloud provider? Because uh, the, the idea of infinite scaling um, is very attractive. Uh, well, I mean, so, so, so we've got a couple of larger companies, you know, that, that we work with. You know, Bezier being one of them, and Bezier do sort of pop up media for. Um, you know, advertising stands and things. So, so they deal with massive amounts of data, uh, and you know, and, and we, they were with big, big providers that failed to understand their needs as a media company and were just arduous in trying to deliver any of the services. So, you know, we've already done the hard work for these guys. We, we don't want to make this hard work for our customers. We want to make it easy. Um, so we have to form relationships with them. And I think, you know, the, the, you know, we're we're a, Verging on a 50 million turnover business, you know, we're, we're sort of uh, you know small enough to be quite nimble, but big enough to actually deliver and put some risk in 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 the game. Um, and I don't I don't see the other players doing that. Certainly, with the large scale media companies, particularly around sort of record companies and broadcast type companies, you know, they are operating on a much much global scale that have a lot more revenue. Um, but these smaller companies that we deal with are generally supplying into these businesses so that they have to work you know, with a nimble company to package up their solution. In many respects, Tim, you know, Star becomes their solution. You know, we are providing the platform of services to allow their solution to be sold up the chain. Mm, there's a lot of this is about collaboration, better collaboration, isn't it? You mentioned before the mergers and acquisitions, and at this point, I would just like to mention if anyone's thinking of buying the register, you can't afford us. They, um, but also, the, a lot of these companies have to work together on a project basis, where even if they're not going to join up together and become the same company. And uh, within the company, they work on several sites on the same project. So uh, this sort of thing, on the one hand, lends itself to cloud technologies because the data can the data can live with you and they can use it. On the other hand, uh, a lot of cloud technologies uh, don't solve the fundamental problem, which is how do you get people to work together? Do you have those skills? Oh, I mean, well, you're verging on cultural differences now, I guess. But you know that mm. that. Yeah, so again, going back to my sort of recurring theme of the moment, which is innovation. You know, uh, innovation starts by people knowing, knowing what direction they want to take. And, and, there, and there will be some, um, you know, we've seen some customers make some dreadful solutions. No, sorry, some, some mistakes in this by not getting the culture and, of innovation in their businesses. Um, you know, all we can do is, is support them as best we can. Um, but there needs to be a sort of... Uh, a cultural mindset that says, you know what, we are we are a young, agile, um, you know, media-based organisation. We want to work with people that are similar. So I think that you're seeing the rise of, of organisations like Star that look and feel a little bit like a startup, actually, in many respects, really dovetailing into into that the, the newer generation. And I guess media has always been one that, that's a little bit more out there than say pharmaceuticals or something, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I think you know. Um, yeah, which because you know, by definition that there, there is innovation because they are servicing customers that are seeking innovation. So if they can't show the latest and greatest technology, then there's almost um, you know they're not doing themselves a, a service in their customers' eyes. So, but you're right, it's a heart and mind win. Um, and, and I'm a cynical old Hector about some of this stuff. Uh, as one example, you know we use a load of collaboration tools internally at Star, and I really couldn't see the benefit until you realize that you can actually speak to somebody on the phone, share a screen with them, look at the presentation you're trying to pull together, you know, put that into a SharePoint uh, asset, and then distribute it out to anyone else who wants to see it. And it's cut down your working day by half, because you're not having to replan and book different meetings. You're doing it as you think about it. Uh, and I quite a petulant chat, so you know, I want things done there and then. So, Rolling that up into into a true business scenario like a media company is, I mean, how fantastic is that? That you're working on an article, you want a certain picture, I don't know, Marilyn Monroe, and you can collaborate with someone from Getty Images to get it there and then. That's what cloud is about, Tim. Okay, well, Grant, you're, you're not half as difficult to work with as people told me you were. I, I'd just like to say that to you. If there is, to sum this up then, if there's one thing that you could say to media companies who are, uh, who are listening to this, 
um, that you could say, here's a cloud thing that you could pretty easily get hold of, sort of thing that you're probably not doing now, uh, you know, and it doesn't involve a six-month project because, you know, they haven't got time to do that. What would you pick out? So I, I would say some of the real functional IT services that, that, you, that you're using today, use them better. You use Microsoft tools better, deliver them in a different way, and free up your IT resources to do the more innovative work. Okay, so that's uh, the media in the cloud. Uh, if, uh, if you're convinced about that, or if you're not convinced, you've got a few more questions, let us know, because we'll pass them back to Grant. We can't answer them ourselves, but Grant can, can't you? I'll try it, and then I'll bring in a media expert that can wax lyrical about how we've worked with some fantastic customers in the UK. He has people to do it for him. Grant Anna, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, welcome back to uh, our RegCast, because we're talking about the pace of change. And when you talk about the pace of change, you end up talking about the cloud inevitably in the IT business. But very often we end up talking about the cloud uh, in this sort of generic, not particularly useful way. So what we're trying to do in uh, this short series of RegCast is to talk about some specific types of business and how the cloud solves specific problems for them, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the great promises of cloud is, is often that you can just get rid of large chunks of your IT department. You can decentralize the provision of those IT services. And uh, so it, talking, with, uh, talking with our uh, cloud specialists for this series of RegCast Star, uh, they pointed out that professional services is an area in which uh, the cloud can maybe help quite a lot of businesses, can help that they, they need and they're not getting at the moment. So to explain more about that is Grant Tanner from Star. Grant, welcome back. Thank you, Tim. How are you doing today? I am doing well, Grant. Uh, I, I, I like to think of myself as a fairly professional person, so I'm hoping that you'll help me with this. Um, Grant, tell me a, a little bit about um, sort of professional services. What do we mean by professional services? That could mean more or less anything. So, yeah, that's pretty a great starting point. So, uh, hello to everybody. So, uh, my name is Grant Tanner, Business Development Director for STAR, uh, and I'm sort of based really with trying to pull together some uh, great propositions into some key verticals. Um, so, we really use the provenance of what we've built our business around, and we probably have more uh, professional services organizations in our uh, customer base than any others, quite frankly. And our definition is people that would get paid a day rate to do the job they do, linked with probably some of the non-for-profit organizations as well as some of the, uh, the you know, government departments out there that are, not, that are not central governmentally funded. So people such as housing associations, charities, obviously law firms, accountancies, uh, some consultants, uh, property developers, etc. So this is sort of you know, the typical white-collar worker within the UK as of today. Mm, now you, we asked you to lay out the sort of business problems that these guys are facing at the moment. And uh, you know, for any of you who are uh, listening to this, I hope you recognize this. I think you probably will. Um, a lot of these guys work with billable hours. Obviously, yeah. you want to increase them because that's where your revenue comes from. Um, uh, they work directly with uh, sort of customers who are, I, you know, I guess in this they, we often call them, you know, the clients. And yeah. uh, but they also need to uh, to innovate because this business is changing as well. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, these are um, problems that are common a lot across a lot of different businesses. What's particularly acute about this in the professional services sector? So I think one of the challenges they have, and, and I guess whenever we talk about IT constraints and things, this whole thing of legacy keeps coming up. So um, as I, you know, I point out a lot, legacy for some businesses in this particular vertical is absolutely key. It's legacy for a reason. It's because it works and runs their billing engines. So these would be legacy HR systems, legacy uh, you know, housing management systems, uh, surveying systems, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, some of these absolutely work really, really well. So legacy does not necessarily mean old. It means line of business. It means bespoke. And it means tailored to the functional outcome of your, of your particular business process, you know, lawyer, housing association, quantity surveyor, et cetera. So 
um, what we are saying really is that you, you, know, you may be constrained by some of your IT systems. You may not always be constrained with your legacy systems, just that you never get off to, to have a good look at them. You know, uh, when I spoke to a housing association recently, you know, their sort of killer application, which they, they, you know, they cannot do without, is their um, housing management tool, which, which they've had for 15 years. They would love to do something more with it, but can never free up the time to actually look at it seriously to say, is there something that could replace it? And this is sometimes incredibly costly. So what we're trying to uh, you know, establish with, with the professional services vertical is actually you know, there are some standards and some governance and some compliance that you need to work around here that would allow you to transform some of your businesses maybe away from this legacy. But actually, if you could transform some of your business um, it, it, by IT and innovate, it might give you free up some more time to look at these legacy systems, which you can focus on, which ultimately your, your life and blood, you know, your lifeblood. You dare not take away somebody's uh, um, case management system overnight. You know that you they, they go bust. So what we are saying and advocating is that you know we can take away some more of those common applications, provide you back the collaboration tools, and we talk about that a little little bit uh, a little bit more in depth. Therefore, freeing up some time for your sort of um, you know, your specialist IT people to look at their line of business application, effectively you know, reviewing the legacy. Um, so I would sort of argue that sometimes you're not constrained by legacy. Um, you sort of know you are, but it sort of, sort of works. You're constrained by finding the time to address what legacy means to you. But I'm interested in how cloud really solves this problem because I'm thinking that uh, you know, if you show up at the door, Grant, you could have an entertaining conversation with them, but they don't really want to know from cloud people. They really want to know about just fixing their software as it is, maybe going through, a, maybe going through an upgrade. Now, you've got on the um, IT constraints that the upgrade cycle is a problem. Well, it seems yeah. to me that maybe it's solving their problem. Oh, totally. So, so again, if you talk about some of the sort of um, – uh, common applications around your working days, you know, typically Outlook or some form of, of messaging platform, you know, so much effort has been put into a technical level to allow those systems to be delivered via cloud um, that I think you'd be foolish to try and develop the same, the same yourselves. Um, that's just uh, isolated half of our audience there, Tim. Um, <laughs> but the, but you know, the, the reality is that people like Microsoft have put enormous effort uh, down at a granular level to make these applications very cloud friendly, um, and you could call that SaaS if, if you like. So you know, Star, Star has taken what those SaaS providers has, have done, embellished it, and pre-integrated it with with telephony, um, with instant messaging, OCS, etc., and delivered it you know per person per month. Now, if you can do that, provide a quality of service around it put some governance and compliance um, around it as well so you know where the data is and you can deliver that per, per month. That has got to be an enormous benefit for, you know, for the bulk of your IT. Um, again, if you can then integrate that back with the line of business applications, um, and again, it would be things like case management, um, you know, housing management systems, uh, conveyancing systems, etc., then you've actually created a pretty slick IT function for the majority of your users that may have taken you in the past years. Uh, and, and if you're complex, if you're large, you know, if you're sort of a thousand user organization, um, the cost to change on that is, is enormous. So if you can do things you know, more effectively by consuming some of the more generic systems from cloud, but have somebody integrate them with your line of business applications, I think you're in a much better place to, you know, to, to, to increase your billable hours, to increase your flexibility, and ultimately deliver a better service back to your customer. Um, well, Grant, I, 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 I've spoken to uh, quite a lot of these guys. I, I, um, I helped out at a, at a conference, and where you know, in the audience, where a lot of these exactly these people asked them for a show of hands, are they using cloud? No, because even for these generic applications, the the governance that they have to put in place was in excess of what a, a cloud provider could guarantee them. How do you solve that problem? So I think you, you, you solve it by certification, and, and you, 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 I mean, effectively, it's show and tell as far as we're concerned. So within the UK, we run our own data centers. We run our own private um, networking. We very much sit in the middle of the Gartner box around private and virtual clouds. 
which is which are secure and proven to be by secure, you know by by uh, external audit. So I think that actually we meet muster more so the internal IT functions of many of our customers, hence they consume the service. You know, we have more expertise in firewalls, SSL delivery, facilities management than the majority of our customers do. And that's also echoed by a lot of the people in, in the UK Cloud Alliance where we have, you know, external auditors and escrow services being part of that. So we're not just saying we do this. We're actually, you know, opening up the, 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 the cupboard and saying, come and have a, a poke around and make sure that we do meet master point. You know, this no, is at, our, a very basic, at a very basic level, for example, you can say to them, your data is not leaving the UK. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, it, and it's not leaving your network, and it's secure, and it's a defense in depth strategy if you want to go that route. Um, uh, you know, and, and you're, you're absolutely you know, spot on, really. Does this take away some of the cost uh, advantages of providing these applications in the cloud? Because this is expensive for you to deliver. Well, I think you know, we, we multi-tenant a lot of these. So when I talk about common applications, they'll also be common across platforms within our data centers. So you know, if you took a mail service from you, you would be taking a secure slice from a multi-tenanted email platform. Um, what we've done is successfully pre-integrated that, though, with the other areas such as presence, messaging, fax, calendars, screen sharing, etc. Um, and, and that's the bit that actually it is costly to do originally, and again, leverage our, you know, the expense we've gone through to deliver that service back. But that's the path we've chosen, Tim. You know, that, that's what we do as a living, and, and that's what we do repeatedly very well. Should these guys be slimming down their IT departments, and if you move that over to cloud services, a lot of the time, the, like you say, a lot of the IT department time is spent keeping email going, for example. You move that over to cloud, you can have a much, uh, a much slimmer IT department, have more people who are, um, who are charging billable hours. So I'm, I'm hesitant to say yes, because my, my approach would be that um, <laughs> My approach would be that the people that know their businesses best are the people that work in that business. So, you know, we wouldn't go into a law firm and tell them how to run their law firm better. Uh, what we would do is tell them how to innovate through technology. And if the technologists within that law firm could work with us to look at their line of business applications to get them better to increase the billable hours, that would be a much better outcome for that law firm. And, and I think the, the key thing here, the absolute key for this is this has to be outcome-based. The starting point is you as a professional services organization, what, do you want, what, what is it you're trying to achieve? Is it more billable hours? Is it more customer retention? Is it more um, you know, freedom to do mergers and acquisition? It has to be outcome-based, and we want to work with IT to make those outcomes the right one for their business. The reality is, Tim, if they don't do that, they won't be around anyway. So the threat is not from STAR. The threat is from how these businesses are operating today. Mm, at start, do you tend to work with smaller professional services uh, operations? Because I, I would imagine that there would be there's a big difference between how a local law firm and a global law firm, for example, would operate. So, so what we find is that our target market is probably from um, about 100 seats up to 5,000 seats, you know, in terms of the size of organisation in the UK, or we work with departmental larger organizations that have offices in the UK. And I think that's a really good, good way of working. And the reason for that is because if you take um, you know, people that are in a regulatory uh, professional services uh, organization, they would want to work uh, in the UK with, lo with local UK providers because, of that, because regulatory says they have to. So I can point to some very large financial services organizations that use star services that are global but their departments or their UK subsidiaries or UK departments use star services to, to, to avoid any of the safe harbor or Sarbanes-Oxley regulatory uh, issues that they may have. So you know, I, I can't just say that we operate in a certain market. We certainly operate in the UK market, and we operate to people that want to utilize UK, UK um, IT resources. Do you, um, uh, do you want to touch eventually their line of business applications? Or are, you happy for, are you happy to keep your hands off those? So I think there's some, you know, if you like, operating systems and middleware and database functions that we absolutely can assist with. Um, but we would bring in specialists within, the, again, the cloud lines that we run to, to really work with the customer um, from an IT perspective to enable transformation, and that's really key to us, and that's the that's secret to success. 
One thing we haven't gone as far is to look at sort of business process realignment and change management. You know, we are absolutely a technology firm, which is the reason we're talking to you as the reg uh, and not to, you know, people that are doing, uh, um, you know, business process change management. And those hand-waving people, yes, exactly. But absolutely. Yeah, but, but you, you know, in doing that, though, then you, you naturally restrict what you can really help with. That you're, you're sort of, what you're saying is you're taking away the messy stuff around the edge so they can concentrate on the, the, the difficult big applications that are specific to their business that they've built in the middle and they can fix them themselves. So I'm, I'm not saying they can fix them themselves all the time. I, I'm, I'm saying that we would, as, as far, we would actually you, you know, work with them in collaboration. So, so if you take things like um, social business, which might actually be a better way of working as opposed to using email if you're a professional services organization, um, we would bring in somebody that's an absolute expert in that field, and we have done. So there's a big rise around social business tools. Um, we're very much a part of that as a collaborative within the Cloud Alliance to deliver those services. We're also, you know, very um, involved in things like SharePoint, which actually could be a replacement for case management systems if you so wish, dynamics in the CRM space, etc. So we are very application aware and application friendly, but we are not a system integrator and we're not a business process outsourcer. However, we will bring those specialist areas into the technology debate with our customer base. For us, that's a differentiator because as small as, as far you know, maybe to some of these Goliaths, it allows us to be very, very flexible, very nimble, and deliver projects on time. Um, again, one, one, one of the things you have touched on there, I just want to make sure we get this in, when you're talking about social business, that also touches on the idea that a lot of these businesses have people working in a lot of locations, or working in other people's offices, or working, uh, you know, or, or just working from home a, a, a lot of the time. Can you, do you help very much with that? Absolutely, we do. So, from an infrastructure as a service point of view, you know, remote working and uh, and those things are just it's just in our blood. You know, those are products you can literally order online from us. You know, SSLs and those types of things. But then it moves much more into okay, what type of device would you like to serve that data up on? Is it thin client? Is it smartphone? Is it iPad, etc. And again, very acutely aware that you know, in professional services, probably more so than elsewhere. There needs to be a ubiquity about IT, you know, the freedom to work anywhere, the ability to, to still track um, the billable hours, et cetera, through, through whatever systems they are. And absolutely right, Tim, you know, we, we worked with a, a quantity surveying organization that, that, was, that was global, um, that were taking sort of the generic services from us, but wanted them distributed to Dubai. So how do they jump on a Wi-Fi in Dubai and get to, you know, the services? Well, Cloud is a fantastic service for that. Now, the reality is the data resided in our data centers in, in Bristol and London, but they did get access to that. It's a seamless service, um, and, and, and it just works. Um, the, the secret is how, you know, Star has to make sure that it just works by doing the really hard bit of pre-integrating the solutions. One of the things that... Uh, very much part of this, and but was also a part of um, the conversations, the separate conversations we had about media and retail, is that a lot of cloud providers uh, have a sort of passive model where they say, get your biz, get 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 your uh, some of your infrastructure or your applications from us. We're not really getting involved apart from providing it, and we'll give you some guarantees around providing. It. You do with it what you will. Your uh, model seems to be very much more active and uh, very much more involved day-to-day -day in the business. Is this uh, a way in which you see yourself as different from a large generic cloud provider? Is that, is that the right way to look at it? I, I think you're right. I, I think over time, um, and without the risk of getting fired by my CEO, you would probably find people like, like uh, Star becomes uh, cloud integrators or cloud brokers. We're very much a cloud integrator today on our own product suite. So, you know, we take a, a, our version of SaaS, Work Life Talk is the product name, to market to provide the complete wrapper for desktop <clears throat> messaging, collaboration, OCS, et cetera. Um, and that will link into other areas such as customer relationship management, contact center, et cetera. So the key thing is today we are integrating those services and delivering them out. Tomorrow, those services could be federated to either the customer's on-prem 
or even the customer's third per party, or even, at a push, the customer's other suppliers. Uh, and you know, we do touch on this a little bit today around um, how we work with content providers, where the, 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 the origin servers may not be within the domain of, of, um, of a star data center, but nevertheless, we can consume, integrate it, package it, and deliver it pay as you go. Um, so you know, that, that's the direction I think the market is moving, and I'd love to think that Star is ahead of that market. Yeah, to, to wrap this one up, Grant, next time I'm standing up in front of these professional services guys, they got their arms folded and they're scowling at me because I've mentioned the cloud, I'm going to say to them, Grant Planner tells me that this will change your mind, and so now you have to provide me my line. What would you say to them? Ah, uh -huh. exactly. Well, I, I think, you know, look at the outcome based. You know, if you are a professional services organization, what is the outcome that you want from IT? You know, is the outcome increased billable hours, increased customer service, or is the, is the outcome actually you just want to innovate to be a leader in your field? So please use IT to do those things, and Star can get you there. Lovely. Grant Tanner, that's, uh, that's fine. Thank you very much. Now, um, you know, also, if you've been listening to this and you're thinking, oh, this was useful, but I'm actually in retail or the media business, well, yeah, that means you've been listening to the wrong Regcast because uh, we've also been talking to Grant about those two subjects, those two vertical markets. So please, you know, listen to all three of them. There's good, there's good stuff in all of them. Grant, thank you for helping out with all that. It's been pretty useful. I really appreciate the feedback, Tim, as always. So, um, yeah, please be challenging. That's the way we grow as a business. Yeah, and so what he's saying is exactly right. If you've got anything you want to ask or some things you think he didn't say, let us know. Get in touch with us. We pass it on to Grant, and we say, sort this one out for us, mate. And he has to, really, at that point. And um, so, you know, please do. It's kind of like free advice almost, isn't it, really? Um, thank you very much for listening to this RegCast. Let us know what we can do for you, and we'll try and do it for you. But uh, you've, uh, you, uh, thank you for listening to this, and uh, thank you, Grant, for showing up. And uh, we'll have you back again, Grant, if we can think of some more vertical markets. How about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll do some more reading on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the secret of a business development manager. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Grant. And uh, so, uh, and uh, we will um, see you again soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Great. Thanks. Bye. Grant Tanner has gone.